Dave DeBroncard, who's widely known as ePatient Dave, even I follow him on Twitter, is a cancer patient and blogger who has become a noted activist for healthcare transformation through participatory medicine and personal health data rights. The term e-patient was coined by Dr. Tom Ferguson in his, in his subject of his influential paper, e-patients, how they can help us heal healthcare. Mr. DeBoncourt is a leading spokesman for patient engagement, speaking at more than 180 conferences, probably now we can count 181, we'll just keep ticking it up, it's like going to McDonald's, we'll keep moving up, um, and policy meetings internationally over the past two years. He is a founder and board member and past co-chair of the Society for Participatory Medicine. In 2009, Dave's blogging about health information technology put him on the front page of the Boston Globe and thrust him into federal policy discussions about patient access to medical records under meaningful use. That same year, he was named in Health Leaders Media annual list of 20 people who make health care better for his role in bringing recognition to the importance of the e-patient movement. Please join me in welcoming Dave DeBronckhardt. It has indeed been uh, a crazy ride. Some people listening to my story have said, you know, if this was a Disney movie, people would say this only happens in Disney movies. I mean, there I am, just a random cancer survivor blogging in his living room in Nashua, New Hampshire, and then I'm on the front page of the Boston Globe, and a week and a half later, I'm at a conference in Boston, and people are saying, I can't believe it's you, I get to meet you. And I'm like, what? And then US News was there, and I was in the best hospitals issue. And yeah, I'm still just mom to the kids, you know? That's, but the, but I never would have set out to say that the world should listen to me. Uh, it was other people who said, no, what you're talking about, which is just my observations, is something we should hear more about. Keep talking about it. So I, I went along with it. And for the, uh, you know, I've had a lot of good jobs in my life, as you'll hear. I was just a, a random high-tech marketing guy. Let's see if we can make the computers talk to each other. Good. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, th things happened, and uh, I, well, I, I might as well just get started. Th this is the emblem of the Society for Participatory Medicine. Uh, I, when I started blogging, I had worked in marketing, so I picked a nickname, and I just used that as a consistent brand. Uh, and so I chose ePatient Dave for reasons you'll hear. On when Twitter came along, I became ePatient Dave, and on Facebook, I'm ePatient Dave. My website is ePatientDave.com. And if you need to ask what my Skype ID is, then you've got a branding problem. Okay? <laughs> and you know, it's funny because the, the concepts, you know, ideas float through the ether, through the internet. You're welcome to friend me on Facebook, but please drop me a note to say I heard you talk at blah 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 because. I don't say yes to everybody because there are creeps on the internet, you know? So, so, so say hi and let me know. Uh, I want to say that uh, it's nice to return to Michigan. A year ago, my wife and I toured the state. Uh, she grew up in Michigan in all these places. I, I have a feeling, I've never really gotten a clear statement on this, but I have a feeling they were always one step ahead of the landlord as they... Uh, <laughs> Her mother was a radical home ec teacher, uh, trying to teach. This is, you know, in the early 1950s, trying to trying to teach girls things they were going to actually need to know about uh, in life. And she also taught shop class. And her father was a PTSD victim, you know, from World War II. Uh, he, when he came back from the war, he was never right. Just explosive anger and never able to hold a job. Anyway, uh, she, her memory of the Mackinac Bridge is, as a little girl, watching the trains go by carrying the girders to build that bridge. And we toured a lot of the state last year during that April week. It was warmer last year, I'll tell you. <laughs> and she, uh, she became a veterinarian at uh, Michigan State. Uh, so got a lot, of, uh, a lot of warm memories. As I said, I worked in high-tech marketing, specifically graphic arts, typesetting, if you can remember that typesetting machines, not hot metal, but all the f CompuGraphic and so on, uh, photo typesetting machines. 
I know what it's like when an industry gets radically reorganized by technology. Because in those days, someday I'll write a book about this, in those days, if you wanted one piece of typesetting, fonts or fancy page layout or anything like that, you had to go get a bundle of things from one location, you know, the typesetting shop. And to some extent, there are analogous things happening today. There are some things that are valuable in medicine that are now available outside the establishment, and it raises really threatening identity questions for the people in the industry. It's like, well, if people can do some things by themselves, where does that leave me? And part of what I hope to share with you is what's changed and what hasn't. I'm a data geek. I confess it. I do unnatural acts with Excel. I do, I do formulas and pivot tables and graphs. You should have seen what I did when I, you know, I lost, I went on Cobra, or my Cobra expired a year and a half ago. And in New Hampshire, where I live, there are no pub, uh, there are no open commercial insurance policies for cancer survivors. So I went into the high risk pool and boy did I become an activated consumer as I shopped for my options. There's a whole separate talk about that. I love tech trends and automation. One of my obscure claims to fame, talk about a niche, is that I've, I wrote the world's fastest software for typesetting business cards. Um, now that's, that's a niche. But you, know, there's, uh, but you know, when Bank of America acquires a bank and everybody in the new bank needs business cards, letterheads, envelopes, and so on, high volume work. And one thing you learn there, the reason I mention this, is that when you're automating things, the data has to be good quality. The data has to be accurate, or you end up with the printing press spewing garbage at high speed. All right, and this is something in other industries. Long ago, those of you who are old enough to remember when phone bills were first computerized, or credit card bills, sometimes you'd get somebody else's statement in your envelope. Well, over time, they have nailed that down. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and what, we're, what we are in the process of discovering is that there's a whole bunch of medical record data that is wrong. Right? And if you put that into a computer and then display it to somebody, they get a wrong impression. So one of the challenges we face is going to be data quality in the medical records. 2007, I discovered I was almost dead and got better. I'll be sharing that story. I'm not kidding. I was diagnosed in January and my treatment ended in July. Uh, some people think that patient empowerment and patient engagement are anti-establishment, anti-medicine. No. I love the people who saved my life. My wife loves the people who saved my life. My daughter loves the people who saved my life. This is about a new role, a, a new balancing, rebalancing of roles. I'll be describing that. 2008, I started blogging about the e-patient movement as a hobby, because it turns out my primary physician was one of the pioneers in the field. 2009, they found, formed the Society for Participatory Medicine, and I started giving speeches. In 2010, I felt the calling really truly. I've had lots of good jobs in life, but I just, I felt for the first time in my life, this is why I'm here. People kept saying they wanted to hear about it, I wanted to talk about it, and in 2011, it went international, and uh, here we are. Two of the two senior physicians at my hospital, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, particularly the one on your right, Warner Slack, have been saying since the 1970s, that patients are the most underused resource. Now, they were talking about in our IT systems, a lot of people are saying it this day, these days in all regards. Uh, and I am not the sort of person who says, well, really, everybody should have all kinds of power, and right, if we think lovely thoughts, then we'll have hearts and flowers and bunny rabbits. I'm, I'm a guy who has watched industries evolve over the decades. And you win at this game of anticipating the future if you accurately understand what has changed and what has not. So that's what I, I'll be sharing with you. Foundation principles. First of all, patient is not a third person word. Okay? The very first health policy meeting I attended outside Boston, I noticed, I had no idea what was going on in the room, but I noticed that everyone was talking about patients as if it was somebody down the road at Target. Okay? And I'm, so that when my time to talk came, the first words out of my mouth were, 
I want to propose that we reconsider our use of language. And I actually said, patient is not a third person word. Your time is coming where, and I know some of you have, been, have had this moment, right? Where it will be you yourself in the hospital bed or your mother, your child, thinking, dear God, I hope she survives. You know, so think about what, if you haven't been through this yet yourself, think about what I'm going to describe. And it sounds, by the way, I'm blown away by the stories I heard during these awards. What achievement. Unbelievable. I mean, I already tweeted, see, see, it can be done. You know, 95% hand hygiene. Unbelievable. Uh, th there are a lot of people out there who think it can't be done. They just think these things happen, you know. Anyway. Patients are the ultimate stakeholder. They have, by that we mean they have the most at stake in how well it all works out, yet they're often omitted from planning the future. From the discussions I heard at dinner last night and this morning, it sounds like Michigan is ahead of most of the United States in this area, but I'll tell you, there's still a heck of a lot more to be considered. I mean, some of my friends now are questioning, like I have a friend with Parkinson's, he and his peers are questioning the research agenda that the, uh, that, that, that the scientists are using, it's like they, they say that they're actually pursuing the wrong therapeutic objectives. I can go on at lengths about that. And as somebody who has watched industries change, I've learned to look for what are the points of leverage, all right? And this is a, this is a big one, the urge to care for our children and elders, because a lot of the work we do, uh, people have frustrated themselves tremendously by thinking that they can solve a problem by providing more facts. Like here, if I tell the patient what's going to happen if they don't lose weight, they'll change their behavior. Right? Or if I tell physicians about the risks of hospital-acquired infections, they'll wash their hands better. Information alone doesn't change behavior. So you look for what does, and this is a big one. It's a cultural issue. So for instance, when I talk to people a couple years ago about my access to my record, like I want to see what's in the thing, Okay, there'd be a certain amount of, well, do you really need that? I mean, what do you do? Do you not trust me and all that stuff? But nobody acts that way when a parent wants to get engaged in the care of a sick kid. All right? And I have two sisters who are the, essentially mastering, monitoring the care of our mom, uh, keeping her successfully aging in place at home so that she doesn't have to move into, uh, into an assisted living facility. And they generally, when what, what they want to do is help take care of mom, they don't get pushback from providers. So this is an important thing. There's this acceptance of care within the family. Now, Tom Ferguson, as you heard, uh, it was the, I never met him. He died in 2006. And his manifesto that he was working on, this 120-page paper funded by Robert Wood Johnson, he was working on it when he died. His team uh, finished it after his death. Uh, he was a post-Woodstock era graduate of Yale Medical School. And some of you may recall there was a hippie self-sufficiency book called The Whole Earth Catalog, which was about how to grow your own food, build your own house. And he was the medical editor of it in the 1980s. And he talked about, he published a magazine and then a book called Medical Self-Care. He was on the Today Show. He was in the famous 1980s book, Megatrends. Uh, and he, he saw that, you know, the vast majority of what we all do is take care of ourselves and our families. But he also saw, so he talked about how to do that, but he also saw that when you, you end up in trouble, a major factor limiting how much you can do to take care of your family is access to information naturally. And when the internet came along, he saw that that radically changed things. It didn't make us surgeons, it didn't make us diagnosticians, it didn't make us anything of the sort, but it gave us access to information. And he anticipated what would happen. He started predicting things in the mid-90s, and then he spotted these people. Uh, you can see across the top here, the one on the left is Jill Friedman, the founder of ACOR, which is the patient community that I eventually joined. Next to him is Alan Green and his wife Cheryl of drgreen.com, the first website, physician website recognized by the AMA. In the middle is Dr. Danny Sands, who's my primary physician, and so on. And he coined this term. He said, e-patients are equipped, engaged, empowered, enabled, of course, electronic. Some people have said expert about evidence. Pick whatever E you want. Well, in 2009, 
That gang of rowdies, and some of them are significantly crazy people, as many pioneers are, just radical thinkers, they, incorpor they decided the time had come to incorporate as the Society for Participatory Medicine. The emblem is a handshake. And much to my amazement, they said, you know, this society can't be run by just an MD. It's got to be run by a doctor and a patient. And they elected my doctor and me as co-chairs. So I went from almost dead in 2007 to chairman of a medical society in 2009. The nifty trick. Some people have described it as the jujitsu approach to cancer. You use the energy, <laughs> the energy of the attacker to propel yourself forward. I don't know. Well then, and as you heard, in two, so Health Leaders Magazine, which goes to hospital executives, interviewed Dr. Sands and me and a number of others. Uh, and th this is interesting because, you know, normally you form a nonprofit and you raise money and then you go out and try to get publicity. Well, no none of that happened here. Health Leaders came to us and said, what's going on here? They interviewed us and much to our surprise, they made it a cover story. Now, if we had hired a PR firm, we would have said, dude, excellent, you know? But the, that, uh, and they, they really got it right, because in the subtitle there, they said, a new relationship. It is not about what patients are doing differently. It's not about what clinicians are doing differently. It's about the shift in the relationship. We describe it as new dancing lessons. You know, when I was in first grade, and my mother sent me to dancing lessons a long time ago, the girls wore white gloves. Boy, was that a long time ago. Anyway, the boy led and the girl followed, right? By the time I was in college, things had changed a bit, you know? And everybody needs new dancing lessons. Like, what are you doing? Why did you do that? Um, so anyway, they sent a photographer. I thought it would be the usual headshot that gets cut into a column of type. I would have worn a different shirt if I'd known they were going to do this. <laughs> full page on the table of contents. But this is kind of the point. The editors of Health Leaders, I mean, of all the photos that photographer took that day, honestly, to the, to the editors of Health Leaders, the patient of the future is a middle-aged schlump sitting at home looking stuff up on his laptop. <laughs> so you can see the people who walk in the door you know, of your facilities, this is what they see going on. And then every December they run 20 people who make healthcare better. Uh, and number one on the list was Atul Gawande, the astounding, fabulous surgeon who writes these incredible essays about quality, the best of medicine, the worst of me medicine. Number two was Dean Kamen, uh, the inventor of the Segway scooter. His company now is making extraordinary robotic limbs for amputees. You know, some of the pictures coming out of Boston, you know, there's a, um, a woman who lost her legs last year, and it's moving. You know, the, there was a Marine who lost his legs in Afghanistan who came to visit her, and the, the look on her face in the hospital room when she saw a glimpse of what her future can be like. Because, you know, watching him from the, from the waist up as he walked into the room, there was no indication at all that there was anything out of the ordinary for him. And anyway, that's Dean Kamen's company. Imagine my amazement number, when number three on the list was me in that stupid shirt. It's like, it's like what am I doing? And I, I've got to say, at two conferences, I've bumped into both of those two guys, and I got them to sign my page of the magazines. Like, wow, is this fun? And, but importantly, number four was Dr. Sands. We were pretty much tied. So again, we didn't hire a publicist for this, but health leaders said that doctor-patient partnership now belongs on the same page with Dean Kamen and Atul Gawande as things improving medicine. So I'm asking myself, what's going on here? Now, in high tech, you learn the hard way that something that generates a lot of excitement at first does not always last. You know, the iPad has changed the world, but you know, 20 years ago, there was a thing called the Apple Newton that had a similar amount of buzz at the beginning and was a total flop. It's hard to tell what things are going to pan out. So I asked myself, and by the way, when the iPad was released, about a third of the blog posts said things like, why can't Apple do anything right anymore? You know, even if you're a trained industry observer, it's hard to tell what's going to pan out. So I said, all right, 
am I actually an indicator of the future? So I went looking for data points. Well, first of all, who's getting online? I've been online since 1989 on CompuServe, uh, back when you had to have a phone modem and you paid by the hour and you paid more dependent per hour depending on how fast your phone modem was. Well, in 2009, 20 years later, the Pew Internet and American Life Project says 83% of U.S. adults are online. So by that one data point, what this piece on the Monopoly board was doing 20 years ago is mainstream now. All right? But that's just one data point. Then I looked at, well, who's romancing online? Well, I found my wife on the Internet. <laughs> In 1999 on Match.com, yes, I did. I had been in a distance relationship with a woman in Florida, and son of a gun, I found somebody worth marrying 12 miles from my house. And a year later, oh darn, I had to give a speech in Paris about XML data. So we got hitched and made a honeymoon in Paris out of it, and there she is on top of the Musée d'Orsay. In 2009, one in eight U.S. weddings was people who met online. Isn't that interesting? And that was when Facebook was only a couple of years old. In 2011, it's up to one in five couples met online. Now, people say, stay off the internet. There's garbage on the internet. <laughs> well, before I found Ginny, I went through some suboptimal search results. <laughs> and if you've ever been on eHarmony or anything of the sort, you know what I mean. But here's the important thing, OK? I didn't marry my first search result. Right? And the latest, it's true, think, think about this. The latest Pew data says that people will, people, more than half of US adults regularly search for some health related information, okay? Can't turn back the tide, you can't say stay off the internet, just come on, get real. But before they take any significant action, Susanna Fox found, they check with their trusted authority, their doctors. All right, so what's happening, I have this, this new little book, Let Patients Help. It says the, that Googling is not a bad sign. It's a sign of patients being engaged in their care. So what we want to do is teach people how to do it more effectively. Now, I'm going to talk about my case. I had moved away to the Midwest for a few years and then moved back in 2006. And before I reconnected with my primary for my annual physical, uh, I wanted to think ahead, so I sent him an email with 12 items I wanted to go over. Now, some people say, oh, you did what? You emailed your doctor? You gave your doctor an agenda? He says, well, yes. He, he was grateful because he had things he wanted to go over, too. We commonly in medicine don't do things that are ordinary in other parts of life. Right? If you're going to see a trusted professional that you don't see very often, don't you think ahead? Well, here's how this worked out. I had a weird thing going on in my right eye. I had a kind of a, a, a dazzling, sparkling spot that started growing over the course of a few minutes, and it became crescent-shaped, and it grew and grew until it outgrew the eye and was gone. Now, rather than, now the first time it happened, I thought, whoa, flashback, I'm a child of the 60s, right? <laughs> the second time, I thought, huh, because it happened exactly the same way. And the third time, I started taking notes. And rather than waiting until I got into our minutes together to describe it to him the way I just did to you, I went out Googling. I found numerous websites that just didn't match, but then I found one that did, and I pasted it into my email. I said, that's what it looks like. All right? People say patients shouldn't diagnose themselves on the Internet. Well, this was a website about ophthalmic migraine, so I pasted that in with a question mark. Who am I to know if that's what it is? I gave him the URL so that he could assess for himself whether it was a good website or a junky one. Right? And I pasted in my little diary as well. And as it happens, we got this resolved before I even got to the visit. Now another item, so that's what an engaged patient... See, I wasn't being the doctor. I was doing everything I could to communicate effectively what I was seeing. There was an article in, in Time magazine a couple of years ago by an ER doc named Zachary Mysell about how a patient had brought in, she had a difficult rash, and she had brought in printouts that he said helped him make the right diagnosis sooner. You know, I found this site and it doesn't look like this because of this. I found this and it doesn't look like this because of that. And I think it's this. And she had it wrong, but, he, but what she had done helped him get to the right diagnosis faster. 
That's patient engagement, patient activated patients contributing real value in the therapeutic transaction. I also had a sore shoulder. No big deal, it was just, instead of, uh, it was just stiff. Instead of reaching up like this, I'd rather do this. So I said, I'm probably going to need a, re a referral to a shoulder specialist. Please set that up in advance, because I don't want to wait three months after I see you, you know, because referrals at that time in Boston were really difficult. Well, I had the physical in, at the end of December 2006. On January 2nd, I had the shoulder visit with an x-ray. And the next morning is a moment that is burned in my memory in total multi-sensory ro recall. And if you've ever had a phone call like this, you'll know what I mean. And what is the mechanism by which these things, the mind goes into total record. Just amazing. I'm sure the same mechanism is what fries people's brains in something like PTSD. Something just gets recorded and you can't re get rid of it. 9 a.m. on the dot. I remember what the surface of my desk looked like. I remember what the blue cubicle carpet looked like. I remember what the Sony phone on my desk looked like. And the phone rang and it was Dr. Sands. And he said, Dave, the radiologist called me. Uh, and I called up the, 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 the x-ray on my screen at home. And I'm thinking, I'd like to call up the x-ray on my screen here so I can watch. Well, and he's, he said, Dave, your shoulder's going to be fine. It's just a little rotator cuff thing, but there's something in your lung. And that shadow is not supposed to be there. He said, we need to find out what it is. It could be some, a scar from some old infection. could be, um, you know, just some fungal thing. And I... Well, he's... He said, I, I ordered a CAT scan, please call this number and make an appointment. And I said, as we talked for a couple of minutes, I said, so is there anything I should do between now and then, like get extra rest or eat different or something? And he said, just go home and have a glass of wine with your wife. And that's, when that's what you hear from your trusted physician, I mean, he, he said he wouldn't talk that way to everybody. Different patients are different. This is part of the magic of being a good clinician. Anyway, uh, I went in for a CAT scan, my first of many, and here's what we found. This was not the one that was in the, uh, the left shoulder, or the, the right shoulder, rather. This was a golf ball size one in the other lung. It's one of five tumors in both lungs. So now we knew it was cancer. Lung cancer doesn't look like this, so we knew it was metastatic cancer. Um, and at that point, the only thing I knew about cancer was if it spread, that's worse. So out of nowhere, with no particular complaints in my life, I found out that I had advanced metastatic cancer. It raises the question, where's this from? I went in for an ultrasound. He said, usually something like this it starts in an abdominal organ, a piece breaks off and circulates in the blood. And at some point, the heart pumps it at full speed into the lung, and it gets stuck in a tight spot and starts growing. And I had five of these. And so I had the, uh, my wife came with me. She's a veterinarian, as I said. She knows I'm not a dog, but she's seen lots of ultrasounds. <laughs> I got to, so I got to have the jelly on the belly, you know, and we saw the spleen was okay, the liver was okay, but then... This is from a later MRI. This is one of two primary tumors in my right kidney. This one was erupting out the front of the kidney. The other one had erupted out the back, and they were just, the one coming out the back was connecting to, but hadn't yet dug into the psoas muscle, this big muscle that goes from the spine to the femur. Um, so now we knew pretty much, we hadn't done a biopsy, but we knew it was kidney cancer. Uh, I went home and, of course, I Googled. Of course I did. I went to WebMD, which today I know is, is not the gospel. It's not the be-all and end-all, but it, you know, it, it wasn't drinkionizedwater.com, right? And the, I actually, I had a woman latch on to me at, at a non-medical event a couple of years later and said, oh, you had cancer? You know, chemo's a fraud. All you need is ionized water. I was like, oh, get away from me, you know? <laughs> There are crazy people out there. Well, <laughs> look what I read. The prognosis for any treated renal cell cancer patient with progressing disease is poor. 
almost all patients are incurable. Now, I've been Googling since before there was Google, literally. I know, same as with Match.com, if you don't like the first search results, you keep looking. By the third page of Google results, every single page I found said, outlook is bleak, prognosis is grim. And I'm sitting there in my recliner in Nashua, New Hampshire, thinking, what the heck? I don't feel sick. I mean, I'd been getting tired, but I was 56 years old. You know, I'd been slowly losing weight, but to me, that was compliance. You know, the doctor had been telling me to lose weight. <laughs> My appetite had been dwindling. You know, there just was not a constellation that says something's wrong here. My appetite had been dwindling, but I just figured I was finally slowing down. I was less hyper. All those things counted against me when I eventually scored my disease. This is a diagram of stage four kidney cancer from the website of the treatment I eventually got, high dosage interleukin-2. Totally by coincidence, there's that thing in my lung. I'm a poster child, right? If you look at the leg, the first symptom I had was six weeks later, my knee started hurting. I said to people, boy, I wish I could go back to where all I had was cancer. Well, be careful what you wish for. I actually had a big metastasis in the femur. In May of that year, I fainted one morning and in the bathroom and landed on it, and I woke up, you know, my wife woke me up, Dave, 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 and my, my femur was shaped like this. Here's a safety tip. If you're gonna break your femur, pass out first. Because <laughs> I had no pain. I woke up, I was already in shock, and by the time the shock wore off, the medics were there with morphine. The only thing we had to deal with was the ambulance ride down the highway into Boston in pothole season. <laughs> Anyway, the head, that shows a brain metastasis. I actually had one in the cranium. What are the odds of this? So I still have a moth-eaten area at the back of my skull. And because I'm an overachiever, I had these additional metastases everywhere. And if you look at the head again, three weeks before my treatment started, I had what I thought was a cold sore in my tongue, but it erupted. I had kidney cancer growing out of my tongue in my mouth. And as you may know, only the most aggressive tumors grow in muscle tissue. I was sick, and by the time I scored my disease, the available data was not very good, small n, old, not very well matched to me, but the best numbers available said 24 weeks. That will focus your attention. I remember waking up at 1 a.m. that night, look, I vividly recall looking at the ceiling of my bedroom thinking, what am I doing sleeping? My life is ending now. I'm the kind of person, I'm an MIT graduate. When I get stressed, I do arithmetic. So I'm sitting there thinking, late July, let's see, 24 weeks, da 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 June 25th, June 25th. Now, I knew enough about statistics from college to know that the median is not the exact date. You know, half the patients live longer. So, but I was, my dad's funeral had been a year and a half earlier, and I thought, so what's the weather gonna be like the last time I look out the window? Is it going to be a fall day in New England? You know? Uh, I remembered mom's face on that day, and I thought, what's she going to look like when she buries me? I had to sit down with my daughter and her boyfriend. They'd just gotten out of college. They were tight, but not that tight yet. And they, you know, to have this, some of you, I'm sure, have been through this. To have that conversation, here is the news. It doesn't look good. Here's what we're going to do. And at the end of this long gathering, I said just one last thing. You guys, don't do anything stupid. Don't get married prematurely just so you can do it while Dad's still alive. We're going to deal with this. So then, you're left with a question. What are my options? What can I do? So now, some people I know just say, take care of me, fix me, help me. Okay, they don't want to be involved. That's fine with me. I don't say that anyone else should be like me. But when a patient or family member says, how can I help? Let's find ways to help them be engaged. My choice was to get engaged, do everything I can. My doctor prescribed ACOR. My doctor actually sent me to the internet. Now, ACOR proves that when it comes to patient communities, it's the people, not the platform. Snazzy web technology is all well and good, but ACOR is just plain text mailing lists, listservs. You can't send attachments, you can't boldface anything, nothing of the sort. Look at this. Within the first two hours of my posting my first message there, ACOR members told me, this is an uncommon disease. Get to a hospital that does a lot of cases. 
There's no cure, but high dose of interleukin-2 sometimes works. It usually doesn't, but sometimes it does. And when it does, about half the time, it's permanent and complete. Here I am, six years later, okay? The side effects are severe. They sometimes kill people, which is why you've got to get to a specialist hospital. Don't let them give you anything else first. Now, there is no literature to support this, but the patient's practical experience is this, and my oncologist agrees based on his clinical experience. If, they give, if you get anything else first, it reduces the chances that interleukin will work. And here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. Now, how's, how's that for useful information? One of them happened to be at my hospital. If I hadn't joined ACOR, I was still headed for David McDermott. But I've since learned that three out of four patients with this disease never even hear that interleukin exists as an option. Six years later, there is not a single FDA-approved website medical website, establishment website, kidney cancer association, anything that says this. You see, what patients want to talk to each other about is different from what's in the literature. It doesn't invalidate the literature, it adds to the literature. In any other industry, it's natural that you listen to what patients, to what the customers talk about. Uh, so, as I say, now, that's not to say there isn't garbage on the internet. What we need to do is develop ways to understand this. Next thing I did was me being me. I read and shared my hospital data. We have this crummy old 1990s vintage patient portal. Doesn't show me everything, but I read what was in it and I shared my password with family and friends. Some people say, oh, you shared your password? Well, yes, I was dying. You know, what am I protecting? They, seriously, some of the privacy, I will say privacy fanatics actually are being overly paternalistic in saying, no, 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 you don't make the decision for yourself. I know what's better for you. You shouldn't be allowed to do that. This is nuts. They, too, should listen to the ultimate stakeholder. Now, uh, granted, there were things I couldn't understand in there. So, words like craniocaudal and so on, but you know what? People think that the patient operates in a vacuum. In reality, they have family and friends. My wife's a veterinarian. My best friend is an Israeli physicist whose, whose brother is a top doctor there, and on and on and on. My sister's a physical therapist. People don't exist in a vacuum. This is no reason to hold people away from it. I started my own support page on the website caringbridge.org, so I didn't, at the time, it was not well known, but I happened to have just lived near where they were founded just before I moved back to Boston. Um, and me being me, I got out Excel, I read the tumor sizes from my radiology reports. Now, we're all looking for the days where there will be pretty software, friendly software, right, for patients and families to understand the data. I used Excel, you know, in the same way that I was online on CompuServe 20 years ago and so on. I asked them what their formula was, and I don't even know what that 38.18 is. It doesn't matter. But when the tumor started shrinking, that was really good news, because as I said, with interleukin, either you're a responder or you're not. And long story short, here's that same tumor 50 weeks later. And, you know, the, 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 when the leg... Uh, was destroyed, I mean, the metastasis literally was this big in the middle of the femur, right? But I can stand here right now on this repaired leg. I, I love good doctors, you know? It's just, I'm fixed, you know? I am all better. In fact, it's kind of one unfortunate thing is that at the end of that year, uh, I had lost 40 pounds, and I thought, this is great. I've been trying to lose 40 pounds for ages. And I went out and bought all new skinny clothes. I looked like I did right when I got out of college. It was phenomenal. Well, unfortunately, my recovery has been complete. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. What a miracle. My weight is right back where it was before I got sick. You know? So I don't have a chief complaint for my doctor, but he has one for me. It's like, lose weight, you know? So now here's a question. All right, as I said, I'm an MIT graduate. I understand the scientific method. I understand peer review. I understand smoking out stupid assertions like ionized water. How can it be that the most useful and relevant information could possibly exist in a patient community that is not governed by doctors or researchers or anything of the sort? Well, Ferguson's paper that he was working on at his death gives some insight into this. Donald Lindbergh, the director of the National Library of Medicine. This paper, by the way, is at this icon on epatients.net, which is the blog of our society. Uh, and 
It's a free download in English and Spanish. We're looking for people to do other translations. Ferguson interviewed Donald Lindbergh, the director of the National Library of Medicine. He said that when he was uh, in medical school, he was told that a good doctor would go and uh, go home and read two journal articles every night to keep up on things. And what Lindbergh said was, if I did that today, after a year, I'd be 400 years behind. And it turns out that's 10 years old. It's actually much worse than that today. A big cultural obstacle is clinicians who think, well, if there was a problem, then I'd be, know I'd be reading about it in our journals. So a couple of years ago, I got to speak at the library, and I met Dr. Lindbergh at dinner the night before. I said, Dr. Lindbergh, a lot of doctors say this can't really be that bad a problem, it, it can't, or it can't be true anymore. He said, oh, it's much worse. You know, there were 800,000 new articles indexed in Medline in 2010 alone. So, it's not humanly possible to keep up. Then there's the lethal lag time, as Ferguson put it. There is a moment in every clinical trial, every paper that's where people say, you know what, I've got something we're going to be able to publish here. Between that moment and the time it goes through, writing, submission, peer review, and everything, and reaches, reaches doctors' inboxes and gets read, maybe, is two to five years. Now, this is somewhat better with new channels like PLOS One, but still, if you have a median survival of 24 weeks, this is a problem. The idea, the idea that you're dying now and there might be a solution that is out there in press, you know? So what are we going to do? Do we beat on doctors to be up on things more? It makes no sense at all. The average primary physician has 1,500 to 2,000 patients with a list of 10 to 11,000 conditions. My kidney cancer community has one subject that they are focused on. They go deep and wide on this one subject. So this is, you now that I could go on and on and on. What's changed here? All right, here is what's changed compared to when many doctors and nurses were trained, okay? Because of the web, it is possible now for patients to connect to information and each other and other providers in ways that were not possible 20 years ago. By the way, the, the 20th birthday of the web browser is next year. I'm looking forward to what kinds of things people are going to be observing. Uh, it's hard to believe that Facebook is only seven years old and iPads are only three years old or maybe even less, I don't know. Anyway, and then finally there's the fear of death by Googling. Okay, somebody's going to get some stupid advice, they're going to be told to eat cyanide and they'll die. Well, a doctor in Germany named Eisenbach, who today runs the Medicine 2.0 conference, he's at the University of Toronto now, wanted to gather true stories of people dying because of stupid advice they got on Google. He searched for three years and found zero cases. He found people who had done stupid things but could not find a single case of people who had died. All right? Now, isn't that interesting? Uh, he, and then, of course, you compare that to the rate of medical errors. And Ferguson said, arguably, it may be, may be more dangerous not to Google your condition and understand what's supposed to happen. You know, Gawande has a story of Dwayne Smith, a grocery store manager. It was his Stanford commencement address in 2010. The guy was in a horrible head-on crash, uh, and the, the, it was just a medical miracle. The, uh, the ER uh, kept him alive the two weeks in the ICU, and eventually he was discharged in good condition. He lost his spleen. But he was fine. The only problem was that, that, that somehow it slipped through the cracks that he was supposed to get three vaccines to protect against bacteria that the spleen normally takes care of. Two years later, he was on vacation and he picked up one of these bugs that swept through his body. He survived again, but he lost all his fingers and toes. You know? And Gowande at the, the National Quality Colloquium at Harvard that summer, um, Gowande gave that talk, and then two hours later, I, uh, I spoke on the same stage, and I, I ad-libbed at this point. I said, so what if Dwayne Smith's family had Googled splenectomy? You know, they wouldn't be doctors, but what if they'd been able to say, wasn't he supposed to get some vaccines? You know, even better, some hospitals now are starting to share the whole care plan with the family. So the family can watch it, can follow along and say, you know, we missed this dose or what, whatever it might be. I don't have, I'm just saying, listen to patients, let patients help. And Ferguson said, these conclusions are no more anti-doctor or anti-medicine than Copernicus and Galileo were anti-astronomer. 
In fact, here's a diagram of what's changing uh, from a friend in Holland. In the old days, all medical knowledge existed above the line. The dotted line across the middle there is sort of the membrane between the institution and the humble supplicant called the patient. All right? It used to be that all value in medicine existed above the line and was delivered in a one-way arrow. Okay. Oh my goodness, what is my computer doing saying it's on reserve power? Boy, I guess I'll be, um, shoot. Is there, is there a power cord up here? I had plenty of battery when I stepped up here, I promise. The, uh, what's happening now in Medicine 2.0 is, uh, is that the information is sometimes flowing in both directions. Sure, it's just where do we plug it in? Yes, it does. And what's happening now in medicine 3.0 and beyond is we're moving to where everybody is swimming in a common pond of information. Uh, and Tim O'Reilly, uh, the, the internet guru, talks about web 2.0, which is where the web began to harness the intelligence of its users, also the stupidity, but the but they, uh, what we're seeing now in Medicine 2.0 is value is moving around in ways that weren't possible before. What we can now understand is that it's not just that the individual brings themselves to the table, they bring their network. If you think of the dotted lines in that network diagram as being like capillaries, right? if information is a nutrient in medicine, that fuels things and makes things possible, information is moving around through those capillaries Yeah, this is, uh, this could get fun. I like to say that giving a speech is like jazz. And uh, there we go, it's lit up. <laughs> and in fact, what's actually happening here is all these networks are brought to the table. Now, a common objection is, well, look, my patients aren't like that. It's all well and good for you, Dave. You're an MIT graduate, blah, 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 blah. You know, you're a Boston intellectual. Right? Well, my patients aren't like that. They aren't asking for this. Well, at election day, right, election day in November, somebody on Facebook posted this marvelous flyer from 100 years ago, the National Association opposed to women's suffrage with the reasons why women should not be given the vote. And you just see cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance happens when somebody perceives something that conflicts with their view of the world, okay? And people go nuts with their rationales then. Look at this first bullet point, why we shouldn't give women the vote. Because 90% of the women either don't want it or don't care. Oh, I see, so they're not asking for it, so we shouldn't do that, right? Well, 10% are, but 90% aren't, right? And my favorite tortured rationale is the next bullet point here. 80% of the women eligible to vote are married, so they could only double or cancel their husband's vote. Well, we saw how that worked out, right? The, the fact that people who don't know something is possible aren't asking for it does not mean it's a crazy idea. It takes leadership to see what's newly possible and do something with it, all right? Uh, Dr. Sands then says, well, how can patients participate if they can't see what I see, the medical record? You know, this, this drawing, this picture of us there, this was a publicity photo, but this is the way he always holds the computer screen. You know, it's common for people, for patients to say, that, you know, doctors say, I'm pulled away from the patient by paying attention to the computer. Indeed, patients say the doctor's pulled away from me. He has always put it between us because he's always, since the 1990s, viewed the record as a shared working document. And as we get to where, all right, where the record is visible at home in the living room, the doctor-patient relationship becomes part of the continuum of life, okay, rather than something that happens when you go visit the doctor. Here's a key finding, you know, people perform better when they're informed better. And a corollary is that it's perverse to keep people in the dark and then call them stupid. 
You know, and yet that's what happens so often. I hear, well, you know, patients don't understand this stuff. Did you hear about the Open Notes project that just completed last fall? Big Robert Wood Johnson thing where patients in this, there were over a thousand patients, I think, um, who were given access to the actual, online access to the actual visit notes, unedited. And the reason this study was funded by Robert Wood Johnson was because there are so many doctors who understandably are concerned, if we let patients see this stuff, we're going to be flooded with stupid questions or ignorant questions because our notes are not made for public consumption. Why did you call me an SOB? No, that's shortness of breath and things like that. <laughs> I mean, it's a legitimate concern. But what happened, you can Google open notes, okay, what happened was number one, the volume of calls and emails to the practices did not change, you know, it, if at all it was minutely, there were a bunch of other findings, but a really important one is at the end, 99% of patients who had participated, including the skeptics, wanted to continue, uh, and 85% uh, said that it would be a factor, access to their record would be a factor in their choice of providers going forward. So now it's a business issue. You know, if you want to be one of the hospitals that survives and prospers in the coming years, you will have a competitive advantage if you offer access to the chart online over the, provide the other hospitals who don't. Game over, right? Patients don't understand this stuff. Well, if the data is unclear, let's make it unclear like other industries do. All right, and now I understand very well the complexity of data. I've worked with data all my life. Uh, and that, but what happens, you know, see, in my typesetting industry, as we were saying, desktop publishing is a toy. You know, you can, you can do amateurish stuff, but you can't do real stuff. Well, what happens is when the data gets out from behind the fortress walls, software innovators can pounce on it and make it easier to use. Consider this, Thomas Getz of Wired Magazine got this blood test, uh, these, this, this blood work done, and he got this rows and rows and rows of stupid numbers, and he said, you know, this is what financial reports, retirement account reports, looked like 20 years ago. And back then, financial advisors said, well, consumers can't understand this stuff. This is why you need financial analysts, right? Today, they compete based on how snazzy their graphing software is, right? Well, so he took it to his art department and said, can you make this look like a 401k report? And look what they came back with. Red for bad value, good for green, green for good value. You're here for each of those numbers, and up at the top is a summary of your results at a glance and so on. Look, 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 look what happened here, okay? It's the same data, but with better software. So now the information hidden in the data is clearer, and importantly, the same slacker consumer is informed and enabled. All right? You get the data out from behind the walls where other people at their own risk can invest in writing good software about it. Now, the very first talk I gave, speech I gave in 2009, uh, before I talked, I wanted to understand what the psoas muscle was because I'd never heard of it before. Uh, so I found this website, visiblebody.com, where you can click and remove layers. And I said, oh, that blue thing is the psoas muscle. I can see why a tumor coming out of the back might attach to the psoas muscle. And as I was rotating it in 3D, right, I said to myself, wow, you know what I just realized? What if instead of that being a generic thing, that was connected to my digital scan data, which I'd been looking at? I could have Google Earth for my body. I could be flying around inside my body. Now, in the same way that in typesetting we said, well, what are these amateurs going to do with this? Doctors will commonly say, well, so what are you going to do with this? Well, you know what? When innovation gets unleashed, people come up with something. It may be a thousand people who try things, only five change the world. Think about that, all right? Well, so I took, so here's my old scan data, and I'm gonna pop over now. Last year, uh, I got a Mac, uh, and I'm not a platform bigot in any direction, but the, let's see what I have here. Oh, come on, don't tell me this is not gonna cooperate with me. All right. Oh, it's not going to cooperate with me. All right. Well, I can't demonstrate it live. I can show it to you later if you want. But it turns out that this new software, the software called Osirix, O-S-I-R-I-X, takes these slices of the salami, all right, because that's what a CAT scan is, is slices of the salami, puts them back together in 3D, 
that's my ribs and my tumor floating in my lung there. And you can rotate it in 3D. There's a $1,000 professional version of this software, but this is the free version that anyone can download if they've got a Mac or a computer that runs Linux. It's open source, so anyone can add software features to it. Uh, and in fact, it has a slider. I've Come see it on my computer later if you want. It has a slider where you can go in and out. And as you slide it out, it puts the meat back on my bones. It shows my skin and then my shirt. <laughs> there, I had something in my pocket that day. And here's the thing. Who knew that this information was buried in those slices of CAT scan? Right? So this is a glimpse of what will start to become possible. Osirix, as I say, and there's, I've got to wrap up, but the, um, Eric Topol is a world-leading cardiologist, uh, and you know, he says, he points out that the, the days of the stethoscope may be numbered, which is hard to imagine, but you know, he said, you use a stethoscope to hear sounds, to try to visualize what's happening with the valves in the heart and all that stuff. He's got this handheld ultra-scan now called a V-scan. Some medical students are being given one of these along with their stethoscope to carry in their, uh, in their white coats. Um, and have you heard of this? Has anybody seen this thing? Show of hands. This is a new iPhone case with two electrodes on the back. And you put it on your iPhone, and you run the app, and it gives you an EKG on the iPhone. And it is not a toy, it's approved by the FDA. It's available for sale direct to consumers in Europe. Of course, in the US, you have to have a prescription from your doctor in order to get one. But this, an iPhone EKG, last month in New Orleans, after the big HEMS, HIMSS Health IT conference, where Topol stood on stage and demonstrated all these wireless gadgets, uh, he was on the plane home to San Diego. They came on the loudspeaker. I've never heard this happen, but they came on the, it was the second time it happened to him. Is there a doctor in the house? We have a patient who's having palpitations or something. He brought out his alive core and put her fingers on it, was able to establish she was having atrial fibrillation, which she has a history of, so there was nothing in particular to be concerned about. They didn't have to put the plane down. The future I want you to think about is a few years from now when that woman has her history with her on her phone. So he's not just looking at the current situation, but the whole context. See, information can be immensely valuable in transforming medicine. It doesn't replace medical schools. Um, I'm going to jump ahead, skip a couple of things here. I, I have to say, by the way, I, I did a TED talk a few years ago uh, in Holland, and at one point, that when I was backstage, the guy who was running it, I was just kind of, if you've ever, you know, TED Talks are like the Speaker's Olympics. If you ever want to be nervous, this is, this is, I mean, you've got 16 minutes to blow people's mind. So I'm backstage trying to shake it off, and, and I said to the guy, you know, there's this health IT guy outside Boston named Keith who wrote the e-patient rap. And he, he said, oh, what's that? And I said, well, it's, it's like, boom, 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 boom. I want to be an e-patient just like Dave. Give me my damn data because it's my life to save. He said, oh, you have to do that. I said, no. <laughs> I said, the, I said you got to have shades to wrap. And the, the MC pulled out her shades and they fit. And so I did it. And that's, what's, what's amazing about it is that this talk, the talk ends with the chant, let patients help. Let patients help, which is not death to doctors, it's not overthrow the establishment, it's not stop medical errors, it's let patients help. And there are over 400,000 views now. It's in the top half of the most watched TED Talks of all time. So it, and it's, it was so nice. They gave me a vanity URL. It's on.ted.com slash Dave with a capital D. And it's been translated to 26 languages. All right, volunteers can, trans, can add subtitles in, and it's like Persian, traditional Chinese, Croatian, simplified Chinese. Um, anyway, I want to jump to the end. Finally, recognition from the establishment. The Institute of Medicine last September published this report where they said the characteristics of a continuously learning healthcare system, there are four patient-clinician partnerships. So we have reached the end of people saying, well, if this was real, the establishment would endorse it. 
Okay? What they specifically said is a learning healthcare system is anchored on patient needs and perspectives and promotes the inclusion of patients, families, and other caregivers. Okay? So that's it. It's game on. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this book, and uh, this book I just self-published a few weeks ago, and uh, by Monday, Aaron will have a discount code for you to get the e-book of this for free or the print book at half price. Um, here's how it unfolded in my life. This is when I was dying, the night of that physical in 2006. I did not know I was dying, but it's pretty apparent in hindsight. Ten months later at the office Halloween party, I was thrilled when somebody snapped this picture. <laughs> Grinning at the ghoul is like, dude, I got you, All right? I had pictured my mother's face at my funeral, but instead in 2009, here we were laughing on the day when I did get to walk my baby girl down the aisle. And it was so good. I mean, thank you, medicine. Thank you, researchers. Thank you, scientists. And thank you also to the doctors and nurses who, when it was probable that I was dying, you know, I, I think sometimes of, like in particular, the, the nurses who, you know, they get up in the morning, they deal with whatever they have to deal with at work or at home. Uh, they get dressed, they come to work, and it would stand at the foot of my bed sometimes, not knowing what was going to happen, and j just be with me. You know, on top of for that human caring skill, on top of all the technical training they got, and just say, how are you doing? And really hear what I had to say. Well... At Christmas, my daughter gave me a jigsaw puzzle on Snapfish, created by Snapfish. If you don't know what Snapfish is, ask your kids. Uh, and this is the only part of it that I could solve. Can't wait to meet you. And that's because the rest with this was this mess of black and gray lines. And it's just, here's a later one. It's just, I've become a babbling idiot. I've just, <laughs> it's as if I went through some incredible hormone change it's like, I, I say, you're, you're growing a head and legs in there. How are you doing? How do you know how to do that? And I'm, crazy stuff. Well, and she told me a few months ago, I was, she, she said, I know what I want for my birthday. I want a 4D ultrasound. I said, a what? She said, you know, you know she's not a teenager. She said, but dad, you know everything. Well, uh, ultrasounds have gotten higher res and faster, and so they can put several of them together and make a 3D one, and they can put several of those together and make one that's moving. So there is my granddaughter who will be born in July. She has her mother's nose. <laughs> I love this stuff. I love the advances in medicine. There are so many ways. Please, please, it takes skill. It takes brains to see the future. Keep doing what you're doing. Listen to patients in every way that you can. Let patients help heal health care. Thank you.